Moro Moro, and welcome back to Culinary Roleplaying and into the third part of Mystic GME tutorial. Thank you so much for your support and all of the nice comments that I have had in the first two parts. It seems that you guys are really excited for the series, so let's see if we can make a fourth part as well. In the fourth part we will take a little bit more deeper dive into the Mythic GME book itself and just see what other options we might have skipped during our different tutorial episodes. But today we will dive into the subject that you have been maybe the most excited about. And that is how to use Mythic GME to play existing adventures, like pre-written adventures from different publishers. And sorry it has taken so long for me to create this episode, but before I started to make this tutorial, I had never done it myself before. It would have not felt right for just to like start to explain th how the things work before I actually dive into it myself. And to be honest with you, I was quite skeptical. Because for the most part, for me, what is amazing about solo RPG is that you have that open world, you have that open adventure that anything can happen and you use those creative tables to like randomly generate the adventure as you go and just to like discover what happens and that is like that is one of the most interesting and amazing things that you can experience during solo. So the idea to have this massive walls of text that will tell you how things are and how things are determined it like it didn't quite sit right for me at first but actually i had not read many pre-written adventures before and i had like my own biased notions about how the adventures are going to be i was completely blown away how fun it can actually be to take pre-written setting and adventure and use that as your own playground to see how things turn out. It has been really fun actually. And I was quite taken back on how how surprising things can still be, even though you kinda you kinda have to know what is in like in different rooms or in what is going to happen in different adventure paths. But things work mostly the same way as before but what is different compared to like having these randomly generated adventures versus pre-written adventures that we just don't need the meaning tables because we have all the meanings we have all the setup that we need but there are still so many things like in regular adventuring when you adventure as a group there is still so many things that need to be discovered within the adventure. Yes, you know all the characters, you know all the characters' motivations, but what happens when you do this as a main character? How the other characters will react? And it basically, when I started to see the pre-written adventure as a possible timeline in a sense that if things would not be interfered with, those things would happen, if that makes any sense. So it was very interesting to read the adventures and when I was doing some choices with the character and then I had to think, like, okay, so now my character did this, so how this is going to reflect on all the other aspects of the adventure. So basically you are doing the GM's work, or the same work that GM would do when running a pre-written adventure. So if I'm being completely honest with you, there are not any special techniques or anything like that that you can create pre-written adventure or like dynamic or surprising using GME. The most important thing that you have to change is the state of mind. Because playing pre-written adventures as solo, it's unique experience compared to basically like open-ended open, uh, solo adventuring and also group-oriented adventuring. So we don't have any like fancy extra mechanics. The only thing that we are going to add into our extra stuff that we have been adding is just this adventure feature list, which is basically your threat list and character list. But in here you just put all the possible encounters 
and random encounters that the adventure has, like all the different possible story hooks that the adventure book itself or the pre-written adventure itself might have. You just add them here and whenever something needs to change or you feel like it's a proper time to roll these tables, then you can roll and see what aspect gets activated in a sense. But before we get into the today's system, as you can, you might see a little spoiler over there. I have a few important notes that I want to share with you, to, just to like let you in with me into the headspace that we are going to take today, that we can really get this <laughs> pre-written adventure mode rolling. So hit like and subscribe, and let's dive deep into this, okay? Just you and me. So. Here are a few important notes. Like I said, solo experience is a unique one. That is the most important thing, that you are your own master and your own player in this session. And there, there is like nobody else to make it fun or right for you. And that is fine and you have to accept it. These adventures have been made crew play in mind. And that is a fact that you can't change. Not you, not with any modes. And that's why we go into the next part. Don't be afraid to tear it down. And what I mean by this is that don't use the adventure as an adventure. Use the adventure as a toolbox. Don't be afraid to take things out. Don't be afraid to just say that you do something different. The adventure book is there to give you inspiration and ideas. Use it as an guideline on how to move the story forward. And point number three is every system has a learning curve. Whatever system and its adventures you pick, there is going to be a learning curve. And I highly recommend that you will use systems that you are highly comfortable with, that you know the, how the systems work and you are ready to modify the rules and bend the rules because most of the times you probably need to bend the rules a little bit. Pointer number four is prioritize fun over fair. And this is extremely important that you again understand that this is going to be just an inspirational material for you. You can try to play the system and the adventure as it is. You must expect that there are things that will hinder your fun in a sense. And if we like talk about this classic dungeon crawling games with levels and different classes, if you want to play a lone wandering spellcaster, you have to understand that if you try to play the game as it is, your character is probably going to have a hard time. Because these games are mostly balanced around the idea of a full party combination where people have the frontliners and you have your spellcasters. And these are also games that are expecting one player to play one character. So the characters are usually quite complicated. So yes, you can play multiple characters or you can have different NPCs to accompany your character, but it is going to be a lot to deal with. For example, for me, if I want to play a more rules-heavy game, I would rather play a lone character just because I would need to deal so many characters with so many different mechanics that... I, and I love to mess around with different me mechanics, don't get me wrong, but when I'm ex especially when I'm playing solo and I'm still like as a sole player trying to move the things forward, it is really difficult to do that with many characters. And it's really difficult to try to interact with the environment and the world with using multiple characters, especially with the pre-written adventure where there's like so many things you can interact with within the adventure. If I have like five characters and I try to interact with everything, like I I would get too flustered to, and confused to try to <laughs> play the game and it could easily crush my motivation. And one important note of this prioritized fun over fair, there are some sections that we will look into in a second about balance i will tell you right now there is no way you can make the game absolutely balanced there is no way actually balancing this game out and we are talking about game with 
randomness in it. Remember that you are the only player and it's fine to cheat. I don't even want to say cheat. It is fine for you to determine what happens next, even without rolling. And if your character would die and you won't want, want your character to die, make something up. Create some situation where your character would be overwhelmed by enemies that a random stranger comes and rescues your character. And then it's interesting to see and determine who this random character is. Like, if you enjoy your character and you want to keep the character alive, just don't be afraid to save your character from peril. And I'm talking as a person who really enjoys... This sounds really wrong. Who I'm a person who really enjoys death in my TTRPGs. I think death is amazing narrative force that will create the most interesting stories when there is a risk risk of peril. But I also think time to time this this felt unfair for me. This felt like this wasn't meant to go this way. I can easily come up with an exception or excuse how to save my character. And you should do that too. I, and I know and I know you people who play solo and I know you tend to be a little bit too hard on your characters like most of the time. I know I do it too. Now, here, I'm giving you this free pass. There you go. At, that's a free pass from, basically, from death. And I would actually narrate most of the time that my characters have this one lucky coin per session. This one given by the gods, the strand of fate that will save your character from peril no matter what. And the final part. When you go into pre-written adventures solo, you need to take the job of the GM a little bit. You need to make preparations. You need to read the story beforehand a little bit. Like you can try to minimize the things you read and you don't have to read like everything. Of course not, you don't have to read everything. But there are times that you have to stop the game, you have to take the book and read some sections beforehand so you know what is going on and that is the whole point of using the adventure and I know it would be amazing just to like go into different adventures blind and just play and as you go and see what happens but especially with pre-written adventures that are not meant to be played solo you have to do the GM heavy lifting beforehand if you want to make the game enjoyable for you. If you want to play games that are completely open-ended and but pre-written and you want to like experience it firsthand, there's al always video games. This is not me being snarky, this is just an actual option for you. And also you have amazing adventure books like Fabled Lands, which basically works as this adventure book like this open world adventure book where you can go like different sections as a point crawl and you can actually buy Fabled Lands 1 and 2 and those books work together and you can like jump between books as well so that might be a thing for you if you really want to like go into adventure blind as only as a player and you don't want to like mess with all this setting up the stuff so yeah that might be something that would interest you as well. Oh, that was a long explanation. I'm sorry about that. But I think that there is like, in the end, this is really simple and really difficult at the same time. And that's why I feel like people ask a lot of guidance with this. But, it, it, <laughs> but I'm sorry to tell you, there is nothing much about it. You just have to read the adventure and use it basically as um, if you would have like a Lego, pre-made Lego castle, and then you have the figurines. It's basically that, that you will take your character and you will put it inside the Lego castle and then you see what's inside and there are the already made creatures and adventures in there. Or it would be the same to play like different kinds of board games alone, where you can see everyone's cards, but you still try to make the decisions as if you would not know what other people have in their cards. But that's that, I'm not gonna talk your ear off any more about that. You can see in the demonstration how I have 
try to manage all this. <laughs> there are so many different ways to do this as well. So take this as an one example on how to play pre-written adventures solo. I also wanted to take this quote from the book itself, from page 156. Some adjustments have to be made in both how you normally play Mythic and how you would use a prepared adventure. I think Mythic should take a step back from providing structure and detail, allowing the published adventure to do that. So this means because we won't use a lot of those tables from Mythic GME, we might not need to roll that many oracle rolls or try to roll any random events in those situations. And second of all, because we are not playing the, this adventure as a group or as a player and we don't have the GM to guide us, that means we have to a little bit more play along with the adventure. Meaning that there won't be any GM to like really try to push us and guide guide us into the right path. We have to take the book and see, okay, this is what is in store for us. And you will actively have to seek out the adventure. And I think this is a really sc good skill to learn. And, and I have seen that some players just expect the GM to basically spoon feed everything to them. Like they just come, they just come into the table and ex expect that the GM will take them to a ride. But when you play solo or adventure, you have to take the initiative. You have to go to the next location and you have to actively make compromises with your character. Like even if you would have this shady, mysterious character that doesn't interact with anyone. If the adventure says that, okay, a random stranger comes and wants to tell you this story, which will move the story forward, you either have to make the compromise as a character that, okay, my character will li actually listen to this person to tell the story and move forward, or you will have to come up with something else like this mysterious figure is following this individual around and hears it from the shadows when, when this NPC tells the story to someone else. So you have to play mental gymnastics in that sense that you you have to make it work. I wanted to notify the section within the Mythic GM ebook within the page of 157. And I wanted to still talk about the scaling and the issue of balance when playing these adventure modules solo. And I'm not holding this against Tana Pichin, the writer of Mythic GM emulator, because it is an impossible, impossible way to offer any solutions to actually like scale and balance adventure modules and I think there is an, an genuine effort in here but if you try to rely solely on the, this book's idea of scaling and and you will think that okay if I just scale using this mechanic I will be completely fine I, I just want to temper your expectations I think you still need to follow the rules that I stated before about how you have to bend the rules. To simplify how the book simply puts it, if you have a level-based system, just think about how strong is your character compared to the whole party's power. It just asks you to compare your character's power compared to like a whole party of same level or lower level individuals. For example, within the book, we have an example that if you have an adventure made, to four to six characters of levels three, three and five. And if you had like a level eight character, then you could maybe, you could maybe try to guess that this character is, is one third as strong as the full party of level three to five characters. And first of all, when you, and when these different adventures have these different scales, that is, difficult enough that already tells you that there is not like a strict balance within the adventure itself and like i said we are talking about systems that rely on party dynamics we rely on that we have characters that are tough and can take a hit and be the frontliners and then we have the spellcasters in the back so fundamentally if we have a one character we will we will be severely lacking in many aspects, even though our character would be a whole lot stronger than the intended level. So yeah, definitely you could 
make an assumption that your character is basically like half as strong as it should be on that adventure and you can just cut half on everything. I think that is a really nice advice that that suggests to you that, that you can just modify the adventure to your liking. Like I said, just take everything out that you don't need and don't be afraid to break the rules and break the module itself. My only advice on scaling and balancing is that action economy in these games is the most essential one. So if you want to give your character more of a fighting chance and you feel like your character is way underpowered, just give this character another turn in combat. So your character could basically have two turns because actions are the heart of every combat. When you have more actions, then you will be more likely to be the winner. Or oh, one great example on scaling would be that if you have a situation where your character is alone fighting against a group of enemies, I would advise you to give your character another turn basically. So your character can act twice for each combat round and also give the group of enemies two actions that they can share. So if you would have like a five enemies, not all of them would have their own individual actions. You have two actions per round and you can decide which enemies you can use. This will help quite a lot that your character won't be completely swamped and might have a lot, a lot of better chance to fight against groups of enemies or even like stronger enemies. I would advise to you against like these bigger boss enemies that give your characters the two actions as well. So they can basically hit twice when the big, bigger creature can attack only once. Mind you, these are not fixed all solutions either, but this might give you a little bit more survivability in your games. But that's that. Let's jump into the system that we are going to use today. And today I decided to use a system that I'm quite familiar with already. It is a heroic kind of heroic fantasy it's like it's like a combination of heroic and old school fantasy role-playing games it's not level based which is wonderful and it has actually some solo modes so it is perfect for this demonstration this game also has its own oracles so we wouldn't necessarily need to use mythic gme but it is very easy and nice to combine Mythic GM emulator with Dragonbane as well. And why I wanted to pick Dragonbane on today's demonstration is because of the basic Dragonbane Adventures book that you get within the core set when you buy this game. Within the core system you get this point crawl adventure where the heroes of the story are trying to find these different pieces of a statue of Dur Mom, I think. Let's see. No, we are looking for a weapon called Dumb or Dumb Erman, right? Um Derman. <laughs> we are looking for a, the legend of Um Derman, the weapon that was forged for the Dragon Emperor. And the whole idea of this adventure is to find these four pieces of this statuette which will open this ancient crypt's door that will reveal the weapon of Um Derman within the outskirts. So it's this like old ancient center of, of the Dragon Empire, I think. But yeah, basically the whole point of the adventure is to make your heroes go in different locations of the Misty Vale where there are like these many different dungeons and crypts and all what have you. And they are trying to find all these pieces of the statuette. And why I'm saying this is really good adventure to try to solo is for two reasons. First of all, the game actually has rules for solo characters that will give you additional heroic abilities that will give you additional action within the combat, which is wonderful. And also many of the encounters within the adventure itself have have been balanced in a way that takes into account how many heroes are there. So like in many instances there might, well, one of the good examples is right at the beginning. For example, we have a here piece of the, like the very start of the whole campaign, which is this ambush, which is this situation where the heroes are arriving into the Mr. Vale and they get ambushed by different goblins and they will get handed the first piece of the statuette 
that they will get like the legend and the base lore of the whole situation and be like, oh, okay, now we start to, now we need to go and find the rest of the pieces of this statuette, okay. But here we have the section about the ambush, which states, the next moment, goblin scouts attack from point two and three on the map. They are as many as player characters, evenly split between the two positions. And there are many instances like this, which state that there are X amount of enemies according to the player characters or like the number is equal to player characters plus two. So you will get the exact number of enemies that has already been balanced according to the number of characters you have. So if you have only one character, then there would be only one scout that attacks your player character at this point. And then there is also different enemies that have the ferocity rating, which in Dragon Bane means how many attacks or actions each creature has within one combat turn. And here ferocity is number of pieces minus one, minimum of one. So even here you have balancing that will take account into how many players there are within the combat. Not only there is a game mode that tells you how to create solo characters, but even the module itself takes into account somewhat on how many characters are there. While it is not perfect still, this definitely is an adventure and is a system that will make it a lot more easier for you to actually solo it. So that's why if you want to, to start out playing pre-written adventures, I would highly recommend that you start from Dragonbane and from the Dragonbane adventures. And it comes with the core book, so it's really like nice. I have actually made a whole tutorial of Dragonbane in my channel, so I'll leave a link somewhere up there. So you can go check it out if you want. But okay, where does the mythic GME come in? Well, in most cases, you don't need a lot of GME itself when the story is moving forward. Then we have these interesting tables within the adventure books. Like we have here demonic omens. And the, basically the game says that when GM feels like it's a nice time to add these demonic omens, you can add them in. Then you also have like random events. You have random encounters on different locations. Like here you have random events, yeah. And then you have like random encounters within the wilds as well. In journey, random encounters around outskirts and different locations. Now we can put these tables and add them in into our adventure features list. And now we can basically use this list like we would use on any random event or when we would feel like that something would happen like during our travel. Now we don't necessarily have to roll about from the threat list or from the character list. We can easily just focus on using the adventure feature list and roll to see do we encounter demonic omens? Do we encounter a random event? Do we hear a rumor? do we come across a random encounters and you can easily just put all like the starts of every dungeons within here but it will definitely require you a, a bit of reading while you go through the adventure and it's definitely a very different kind of experience compared to just like going into random generated adventure Luckily, most of the rules make it really easy to, for you to understand like which information is for the player character and what information is for you to try to determine what happens next. For, for example, we have here the bolded cursive text which will be read for the players. So this is information that your car player character can know. And you can take as much from it as you want or you can just leave it be. But again, I think this is definitely a situation where I should just show you how I do it. So you get at least some example how I will tear down this wonderful adventure into my own selfish benefit. And of course, we will continue the epic story of Prince Darian today. And not diving into too deep into Dragon Bane system, but it's really really simple system, skill-based system, 
just like we have used in our both first and second episode. We will use D20 in this system and here we have like different skills and we have different values for every skill. So for example if my evade skill is 14 that would mean I have to roll a D20 and roll under. <laughs> that is exactly 14 so I would just barely succeed. So yeah you roll a d20 and roll under, roll low. And if you roll un under your skill, you will succeed. Very simple system. Heroes are made out of skills, abilities and spells and items, basically. And that is everything. And I have already cannibalized the system because I'm feeling quite familiar with the system. So I'm willing to break it down as well. I added an extra my own custom heroic ability for myself or for Prince Darian, which is spell played. Very simple heroic ability. It's just that we can use our sword as an, our spell casting source. Because in this game, you normally cannot wear any metal armor or use any metal weapons while you are casting spells. So yeah, we can't still use metal armors, but we can cast spells while holding a sword. That is basically our heroic ability. Then we have magic. We have army of one, which is our solo heroic ability. And it is really simple as well. We just get basically two turns per each combat round. Yeah, more detailed video up there. Let's not dive deeper into this right now. We can just jump right in into the adventure. So last time where we left off, Prince Darion was investigating with Sir Oliver this mysterious frosting of the forest, if you may. Some citizens of the kingdom have been fallen under this mysterious curse, disease, some kind of unfamiliar effect. They are fallen into this kind of deep hibernation slumber. Prince tried to find some answers within the castle. They even traveled into the next city and visited an old <laughs> old library but prince wasn't with the best terms with the library itself so there wasn't a lot of time to get any relevant information and during this research prince happened to stumble upon this mysterious book that had this kind of eerie eerie energy around it the book's name was the evils within our nightmares. And the book had something interesting hidden within the cover of the book. There was this kind of mysterious key. And wondering what this key would be, Prince went to bed and started to sleep soundly until we, the audience, saw the key to awaking somehow, floating up in the air and opening this mysterious portal. This portal of nightmares maybe. And how I thought that we can tie everything together on today's adventure is to use the Misty Vale as this kind of adventure location. I thought it could be this valley which is in the middle of the island. Here we have basically a scale of 15 kilometers. But we know that that's not basically this whole island is 15 kilometers. So I'm definitely taking the scale down. And I would say this whole vale is basically like maybe five kilometers. So the scale is definitely smaller. The adventure starts from this ambush that these adventurers are coming and they get ambushed by these goblins and then they mysteriously find this first piece of statuette within the body. So I was just maybe thinking that it doesn't fit to the vibe that we are going here with. So I would say when Prince sleeps, first he can start to see this thick fog around him. First it's really dark so he can only feel the moisture on his skin surrounding him completely, grasping into him making him have like <laughs> small shivers and then he slowly starts to open his eyes and he can see open plain area 
and underneath him a road but the fog is really thick so he doesn't see a much further away just from curiosity and maybe a little bit from confusion he starts to walk down on that road and walking a little bit more he starts to recognize a two like a shape of towers he feels like oh this this must be home so i was having a stroll okay so let's go back into the castle he walks closer and closer and he realizes that he doesn't recognize these towers at all or does he we could actually roll and check for this because i had an idea that the misty veil vale is part of the island like i said it's this deeper area but whatever this dream dimension this alternative world is this is somewhere in the past maybe or this illusion that has been created is somewhere in the past so can he recognize this very obscure outskirt location within the valley which is within the island but has not been there a long time and it's foggy i will also give a bane to this roll so in dragon bane when you have a bane that means you basically roll with disadvantage so i will roll two dice and take the bigger dice and we can roll our myths and legends skill and see if we can discern what this location is if the prince can have any idea let's go 11 15 almost almost do i want to push the roll hmm. so in this game you can also when you fail in a roll you can decide to take a condition that will hinder your performance in the future but you can at this situation roll again I will not do that and we will just say that the prince do does not have any idea where we are right now when did i get here i i have no idea when did i arrive wasn't i what was i doing the prince is highly confused he really doesn't re remember going to sleep or when did he come here and he starts to like stroke his head he realizes that he has this key in his hand but now when he looks cl more closely it, the key also looks like a piece of statuette and i think we will arrive into the location do we go do we arrive into from north or do we arrive from the south so are we going to be in 2A or 2B? That we can roll and ask from the oracle. Hey oracle, tell us. I would say it's 50-50 and we will use chaos factor of... Let's just use the middle chaos factor for now. It's 50-50. Under 50 it will be A. Or if we roll over 50 it will be the gate B. 56. So it will be the north gate. The gate 2B. So let's see what does the book say about 2B. A low gateway is flanked by two round towers of stone with pointed wooden roofs. A well-trodden path leads out through the gate and snakes through the terrain. Look out! There is always a villager standing guard in one of the towers. He or she watches the surrounding area and is always equipped with a large horn. At the first sign of danger, the guard blows the local warning signal. Three short horn blasts followed by one long blare. During emergencies, the number of guards is increased to four, two in each tower. Random event, one to five can occur here. Here we go. Okay, so now we know that random event can occur. So now when there is a possibility of random event, I think we can try to push our luck and see if there is any random event. There could also be a rumor or random encounter or even a demonic omen. But let's give the 
random event a chance. Because we are so beginning of the adventure, I don't think that the random event might not be necessary, but let's give it a chance. So let's roll the oracle again. And let's say 50-50, will there be a random event while we arrive at the gate at this moment? 93, which means extreme no. So there is not nothing random <laughs> happening right now. Okay, and when the prince is kind of shakingly arriving into the outskirts, this village guard who is in watch I think will try to reach out, not aim the crossbow at him, but will definitely be more on guard and basically ask from the prince, Harald, who goes there? I think prince is a careful fellow. I don't think he will out himself to be a prince. I think he will just say, uh, it's, it's Darren, Darren Claw Finland. Uh, may I ask? What is this town? I got kind of lost within the mist. Young lad, this is the outskirt. And the well is not called Misty Vale for nothing. Where do you hail from? Will the Misty Vale say anything to Darian? I think we can make one more myths and legends check. And now it's just straight up check because this is basically fact-checking. Three, we succeed. So, I think in the history books and within the history of Claw Finland, the Misty Vale was the old name for the Northern Heights. Or the Misty Vale can be the location within the Northern Heights. But I would say it is some kind of like old term. It is a term that has not been used for quite a while. So Prince is kind of confused by the use of this name for the valley. Darren is really confused by this. He is afraid to say a lot more, but I think he will just try to say, Oh, wonderful! I was looking for outskirts. I come from outside Mr. Vale, from the outer reaches of the island. Please let me in. I, I have this artifact that I would want to try to sell within the town. If that is not too much of a trouble, I think the guard will take a, just a second to think about it and just say, Well, yes, I guess it's fine. Just don't cause any trouble. Oh, of course, I won't. Thank you. I think without any further hesitation, he will be let in. So, Darion is let within the outskirts. And now he is desperately wanting to find some kind of information where he actually is. And now I think he has a little bit more time to actually take a look at the statuette or the piece of the statuette. And he's trying to put up some pieces within his mind and... Why I can't remember anything? This statuette has to mean something for someone. Maybe I should try to find a local tavern or something. And I think he will do just that. And I think he will ask some ad advice from the local villagers and ask where this local tavern is. And for the looks of it, I think he will be guided into the three stacks, which is building number four. An impressive two-story building with a massive thatched roof and a half-timbered walls. Outside the door hangs a red sign that says the three stacks, beer, bed and food, at heavenly prices. Cheery voices spill out onto the street along with the smell of roasted boar. Oh, it's the building right over here. That, oh, yeah, that perfectly makes sense that Prince Darian will first go into this, in this town center over here. And let's also see the statue because it seems like Darian will walk next to the statue. The village square, the inn, the smithy and the shop all face an open space where a weathered statue rises from the earth. It is a strange relic from a bygone era, which seems to depict a warrior in an antiquated armor. The Dragon Emperor. Time has not been kind to the statue. Both arms have fallen off. 
but one can still make out the helmet with a horn-like crown. With the successful Myths and Legends role, the player character recognized the statue as the Dragon Emperor Elodane, who is said to have ruled this part of the world many centuries ago. They also noticed great similarities between the statue and the four-piece statuette on Weatherman's map. Alright, we are supposed to get the map as well. Well, we get that soon enough. Because you would get the map from the traveler, uh, from the first scene where the goblins attack, you will get like the first piece of the statuette and also the map of the Misty Vale that also includes these four pieces. Let's first see if Prince Darren can recognize this individual. So 14. And that is 4. It was just, I will roll again because it was just on the edge here, so it was like kind of like cocked, so I'm not sure which number it was. <laughs> four again! <laughs> okay, it's four. It's definitely four. So I would say Darian will recognize the Dragon Emperor, and he remembers the old stories of Glorfinland's history, and I think the Dragon Emperor is kind of like an ancestor for the Glorfinland family. I think the Glorfinland royal family is like an ancient line, so they have been in this island for a long time, so Darion is basically a descendant of the Dragon Emperor. So of course he recognizes the statue. Now he can basically, he's trying to like fit and see if the key and the piece of the statuette would like look similar to the statue and he can see the similarities. He, he's like, oh, well, that's interesting. Random event. All random events on page 16 can occur here. Let's roll another check to see if there is any ra random events. Let's say 50-50 again. 14. So a random event will occur. Here we go. It was any random event. D6 random events. Da bim bada boom. Two, Quasimund scum. Oh, looky here. What fine visitor we have come to outskirt. I hope you didn't forget to pay the toll. The player character is surrounded by a group of unsavory types. Page 22. Led by the mal malad Quasimund. Page 21. They stink of mead and are as many as the player characters plus one. So they are basically Quasimund and Quasimund's a henchman, basically. The thugs give up if more than half of them are wounded, or the player characters give them money for mead. What they are really doing is testing the player characters' combat capabilities on, on orders from Le Leonara. Interesting. The Malad Quasimund is a failed fortune hunter who regularly frequents the three stacks. He has a bitter and violent side which tends to come out when he, when he drinks too much mead. He has sold his soul to Sajmok for a few pieces of silver and half a keg of mead. The Sath, Sathmog is basically this demon that resides within the adventure as well. And here we have the Leonara as well. Leonara has served Sathmog ever since her family was killed by fanatical Edel Elodane knights. She is a haggard woman of in indetermined age, but with kind eyes and deep dimples. Leonara has lost everything and will gladly lay down her life if that is what it takes to thwart the servants of Elodane, including the player characters. Okay. Or oh, it seems like she has two names. So Lenara is her real name, but I think she uses Annabelle, I guess. And then we have Quasimund's scum. Quasimund's scum are the dregs of outskirt, drunken wrecks of settlers and adventurers who lost everything in their pursuit of riches. Like Quasimund, they have sold their souls to Sathmog and are always willing to give their lives for support for the Supreme Darkness. They attack as a group at least equal in numbers to the player characters. <laughs> oh my god. This, this, this guy looks really... Yeah, intense. And I think when Quasimund comes with his personal bodyguard God, to really like come to test his metal, Darian will just 
try to look calm and just say to Quasimund, uh, my apologies, sir, but I think I have lost all my money and other possessions. Is there is there anything else that I could possibly help you with? And I think Quasimund will take a deep look at Darian and he can also see the statue. And I think Quasimund will recognize the statue because, because Sathmog is basically like the main enemy of this whole adventure. And Sathmok is also looking for the statue pieces. So I would say Quasimund recognizes the statue or the piece of the statuette and will just say to Darian, well, that's a fine looking piece of statuette that you got there. You could hand that over for us. I don't think Darian wants to lose the statuette quite yet. I think he will calmly take a few steps back and be like, well, actually, this is some a family heirloom of mine, so I would hate to part with it. So if there is anything else I can do for you, I would be glad to do it. Let's see if he can persuade these two. Because Quasimund could always... I think it would be also Quasimund's interest to take, to take Darian C. Leonara or just beat him up and take the, <laughs> the statuette. So let's see if if Darian can persuade them to take the unviolent route. <laughs> that is 17. Ooh, I think I will push this roll. I don't want to fight right now. I will take a scared condition. I think Darian can see these vicious eyes of Quasimund. It is kind of nerving in a sense that Darren get this feeling like he would be looking at a like a hollow shell of an individual. Quasimund looks like an individual that like they these people have literally sell their soul. So there is nothing they're basically like undead. They are living but still nothing is there. There is only the consciousness and the body. And just to like, not knowing what it is and seeing it for the first time is really unnerving for Darian. But now we can push the roll. 13, I think that's just enough, right? We have 14 in our persuasion. No, our persuasion is 12. That is not enough. I think Quasimund will just say to his bodyguard like, just take it from him. Bodyguard will like go closer and just tries to grab it. And Darren will unsheathe his sword and just say to the scum that stand back. I will not warn you again. And at this point, I don't think this person will care much. So I think we have to go a little bit into the combat side of things. So Dragon Bane has card based initiative. So we pull cards for each parties within the combat and that will determine the order. And one goes first and ten goes last. So let's pull first two cards for Darian because we have the army of one heroic ability. That is eight and three. And the scum will go at one. <laughs> okay, so the scum will go first anyway. So Darian has pulled his sword and play basically is saying like stand back this very large individual will just pull out their short sword and be like <laughs> and just basically take a few drunken running steps and just tries to swing the sword against Darian and I will now turn to guard because that is this comes action and they will try to make a sword attack and we see that the sword skill is 14 and that is two that will definitely hit and I think we want to use one of our actions as a Darian to try to block the attack so in Dragon Bane you can use either your action to parry the attack so actively trying to defend or you can use your action to attack 
And as a solo player you have two actions so it's really good that you can use the other action to defend yourself and other action to attack. And let's see, I think our sword skill was 12 as well. Yes, swords is 12. Let's see, let's hope that we succeed. Six, that is a success. So, so the drunken thug is running towards Darian and is like, I'll get ya! And tries to make this upper swing, but brings Darian easily, parries the whole attack into the side and tries to use the momentum basically to have an upper swing and attack from this blind spot against, against the criminal. So now we will use our other action and make and sword attack against the thug now. Here we go. That is 10, which means the hit will hit. And because the enemy was out of action, so the thug cannot dodge this attack. And we have a long sword, which has a damage of 2d8. Ooh. And then we also have our strength damage bonus of d4. So we will roll 2d8 plus d4. That's gonna hurt. That's gonna hurt badly. They don't have even armor on. Will this... I don't think... Darren doesn't try to completely kill the individual. I think they will try to... Basically, yeah. Darren is not messing around. When somebody attacks him, that is a vile offense. And he will try to cut off the arm that held the sword. Let's see how this goes. Ooh, and I think he will succeed. Seven plus four is eleven plus two is thirteen. It's just enough. One hit, one fine swoop of the sword, and basically Darian blocks the attack and cuts the arm basically in half. So he blocks the attack and just ha makes this very clean cut. And then you can see on the crown sword and basically the forearm. And the thug is, is shocked from the attack and just takes a few stumbling steps back and basically like falls down butt first on the ground, sitting down and is basically like in this kind of confusion and shock. And the heat of the sword was so clean the pain hasn't not even fully sunk in yet. And I think even Quasimund will see this in shock and in confusion. And Darren will now lift his sword again against Quasimund and just say, you better take your friend out of here before he bleeds out. With this very mean, intense look, Quasimund will just look at him angrily, take the thug, and just say behind him, this is not over yet, boy. And dashes out with, with this thug friend. And I think the other people within the village are like having this intense moment. They, are, they see what is going on, but I think they also know Quasimund to be a troublemaker. And then basically when this scene is over, they Everyone just like continues doing their own chores and Darren will uh, take a deep breath and sheath his sword and walks into the three stacks in. So let's see what we have in the three stacks in. I mean the three stacks. We have common room. The three stacks is the village watering hole from early morning to well after midnight. There are D12 plus one villagers and visitors sitting in the common room, eating, drinking, gossiping, and warming their joints by the great fireplace. Delicious meat stews and homemade beer or meat are served at the normal inn prices. Vaghild. As they enter, the player character are welcomed by Vagnil. Vagnhild. I should. This is Swedish game. I should be able to pronounce these words. Wagenhild. Wagenhild. Although she rumbles authoritatively. Oh my god. Although she rumbles authoritatively. Authoritatively. 
authoritatively. <laughs> Author authoritatively. This game must hate me. She is quite cheerful and friendly and gives each of them a tankard of mead on the house. She offers she offers to answer questions about the area and can relay rumors about adventure sites in the Misty Vale. She also tells the following. Large bats have lately been seen flying over the rooftops. Hardy has tried to shoot down several of them, but has so far been unsuccessful. A mystic named Dranath has settled in the temple area. He, he is an inexhaustible source of knowledge about the past and a skillful healer. Lodging. Upstairs are 10 beds divided between two double rooms and a dormitory. The prices are the same as the core rulebook. Investigations. It is hard to imagine a better place to seek information about the Misty Veil. Vale. Lose, lose the player characters may have missed in other places can easily be placed here, perhaps in the form of rumors or a merry song. Interesting, thank you for this. Is there even more? There are, there's even more. Leonara, the Sathmok cultist leader, spends most of her time at the Three Stacks, where she has taken on the role of a perky, seemingly trustworthy maid named Annabelle. She will not wait long to contact the player characters, as described on page 15. Quasimund Scum, the guests in the common room often include the drunken Malad Quasimund, not in this case, and his bands of brutes. They drink meat and, ex and exchange t tall tales while glaring suspiciously at the other guests. All of them have sold their souls to Sagmoth and obey Leonardo's every command. Okay, a lot of stuff, a lot of information is within this stack in. Let's start with Wagenhild. Wagenhild is an... I won't say that again. <laughs> the jovial woman in her 40s. She keeps her graying hair in bulky braids and wears a thick leather apron. Wagenhild used to be a mercenary and always carries a warhammer, warhammer on her belt. So I think Wagenhild is also the owner of this establishment. And I think when Darren basically first opens the tavern door and walks in, it's the, it's the very classic small town effect when somebody strange comes into your town, the moment stops for a second and everyone like looks at the new person. And basically everyone is like looking at each other and seeing like, is this your friend? Is this your friend? Whose friend is this? Basically like everyone is staring like, who is this individual and who knows it? <laughs> who knows this individual? <laughs> I'm from a small town and I can tell you it's not far off from what you can see in movies where like the like the song stops and everyone like turns to look at you. That's basically exactly how it goes. Not gonna not gonna lie. I'm being really honest in here. And I think Wagenhild will also stare from behind the serving table and just points at Darren and says, You there new face, come over here, sit down. And I think Darren will Carefully, kind of awkwardly, just come and sit down, like in into a bar stool, basically. When everyone is still staring, Wagnerhild will just pick up a pint and basically like <laughs> hits it in front of Darian, and also take this big cask and just starts to pour ale into the tankard or this pint. It's basically, it's tankard. It basically like pours over that, like the sum of the ale just completely covers the table. And, and Darren's like, oh, that, it's top up, thank, oh, thanks. Oh, okay, oh, yes, thanks. Van Wagnerhild just stares at Darren and says, on the house, drink up. <laughs> and just stays and stares and Darren's like, oh, right now? Oh, yeah, sure, okay, it's quite morning still, but... And just starts to, like, drink 
and he tries to like go in half like halfway and he's like basically stopping Wagnerhild is still staring at Darian and basically lifts their other <laughs> side burn and Darian is basically like okay and basically jocks the whole tankard in one go <coughs> It's good stuff. And after that, everyone basically just goes and continues to do their own business. And everything just goes as normal. So, little one, my name is Wagnerhild. Welcome to Outskirts. Uh, we all can tell you that you're not from around here, are you? Yeah, actually, I'm traveled from quite the far ways off, from, outs from the outskirts of the island. My name is Darian Clor Finland. Nice to. It's a pleasure. And Wagnerhild, still having the stern look, just says to Darian that, well, we might not look much, but we do everything we can to help each other out. So if you have any questions or anything like that, just let me know. Just be careful, there has been some kind of weird giant bats flying around, so. Take, take care when you go back out, okay? What brings you to our little town? Well, actually, I have this family heirloom that I have been trying to figure out where it comes from. I, I think it belongs to my some of my relatives who used to live here, but and I basically came here to see if I can find some kind of answers to the origins of the piece. And Aaron basically pulls out now the piece of the statue basically like shows it to Wagnerhild and I think at this point because there was the fact within the book that Leonara will come in contact with with the characters and will try to probably share yeah because the idea of Leonara is basically the de demon cultists wants this weapon to them themselves the demon cultists wants to have all the pieces of statue but they are not being able to find them into the different adventuring locations so basically the idea of the this ca adventure campaign is that the leonara as an annabelle will basically cheat the players to get all the statue pieces for herself and into the for the demon cultists so yeah annabelle basically kind of overheard this conversation and and at least at that point when Darian takes out the piece, piece of the statuette and shows it to Wagner, Annabelle will interfere in this conversation and say, oh, Could that actually be? That looks like a statuette from the Dragon Emperor, don't you think? And Darian recognizes from his knowledge when he saw the statue for the first time. I think he will just say, I was actually wondering that. Do you have any idea or any knowledge of the statute and what it would mean? And I think now is the time when Annabelle will share this legend. The sword of Umdurman was forged by the dragon emperor Eladane 800 years ago, when the world was battlefield for dragons and demons. It is the blade of life, made to maintain balance between order and chaos. It is and it is a weapon for the free and unbound against the ancient evils. But in wrong hands, Undurman becomes the weapon of tyranny, an instrument of demonic darkness and draconic fire. After Eladen's death, the sword was buried in a crypt that can only be opened with a special key. A statuette split into four pieces, one for each direction under Eladen's rule. The truth is that what is today known as the Misty Vale was the heart of Eladen's empire and the Undermond script is hidden under the old temple ruin in Outskirt village. But opening the crypt requires the four pieces of the statuette. They have been missing for centuries, sought by Eladen's servants as well as the followers of the demon prince Sathmog. They can likely be found somewhere among the ruins of the Misty Vale. After her hearing the story, Darren is like, oh, four pieces, huh? 
So there's still three missing. Interesting. And did you say the Dragon Temple is here within the village? Annabelle will probably answer this like, Oh, yes, yes, I did. And it's not far from here. And I think if you would want to, you could actually try to ask from the local mystic about the location of the other statuette pieces. I mean, they have to be somewhere here, right? Darren will probably answer. Yeah, I will probably, I will tr try to speak with the mystic. Thank you for your help, Annabelle. And thank you for the drink. Not a problem. Stay safe, little one. I think Darren will just, having this information, will just leave and try to go into the Dragon Temple to meet this mysterious mystic. And if I'm correct, I think the number eight will be the Dragon Temple. But now we will continue recording tomorrow. Hi there, it's the next day of the filming. It started to get a little bit late, so I decided to take a little break and sleep in between the takes and continue it the next day, which is today. I know this is going to be a long episode, but I, I feel like we need to keep going just a little bit more because we haven't really gotten into... Because I really still want to demonstrate how you can like actually walk through uh, uh, this kind of dungeon adventure as well. So what we can actually do today still is the adventure book itself in Dragon Bane suggests in the page 9 that the adventure reader mount itself is a really good adventure to start with. So let's go meet up with the mystic and hopefully the mystic can guide Darian into the right direction that we can find this reader mount place. So Darian came from three stacks, maybe a little a, a slight stumble in his steps because he had to chuck that big ale in one go and, and basically just left the establishment right after. With a light struggle he is able to manage all these stone steps and arrive at the top of the temple area over here. And now we can actually read from the book what this temple area contains. The temple area, a hill in the middle of the village with weathered pillars and the remains of a circular wall. At the crest stands a magnificent but crumbled temple. It is a peaceful place that exudes a sense of bygone glory and ancient mystery. The temple, the circular main building is in disrepair, but the ceiling is covered with a huge symbol. A, a successful myths and legends role reveals that it is a stylized crown of the same kind as those on the milestones in the Mr. Whale. I don't think we have seen any of the milestones yet. So let's keep that as of now. We just, Darian just can enter this main building and see this huge symbol at the top of the ceiling. Entrance to the crypt. There is a small niche hue in one of the wall segments around the temple. The player characters can find it if they look at exactly the right place or succeed with a spot hidden roll. Carved into the niche are archaic runes which can be read with the successful language roles. Uh, okay, I think we will leave that for now because we have no idea what this location is and we are not, and Darren is not even generally looking for anything, so I don't think we have the chance to find this entrance just now. Noct nocturnal visits. If the player character visits the temple during night time, they will see Leonara on the first night, she sneaks, she sneaks into the temple area and releases one of her bats, which flutters all over the rooftops with an unpleasant squeak. She then spends about an hour searching the area, seemingly, seemingly without success, before returning to three stacks. Well, it's not night, so that's not gonna happen now. And random events can occur here. We just had a random event, but I will still give it a chance. I will say it's unlikely that we will encounter another random event right now. And that is 04, which means extreme yes. So there is definitely a random event. But because it's extreme yes, I will roll the adventure feature table. So it could also be a rumor or, or a demonic omen or something like that. So let's roll, oh we don't, we roll a d10, okay. So let's see what we actually notice here, find, encounter. 
4. A random event. Well, that was easy enough. So a d6. Let's see what happens. 6. Cowardly murderers. Okay. The player characters hear excited cries and clashing swords from, from a dark, dark alley. If they hurry over there, they find a, a Alphilia shadow leaf lying on the ground. Three shadows are fleeing the scene. They are part of Quasimund's scum. And the player characters may recognize them from the inn. They are trying to run away, but will fight to the death if stopped. If questioned, they proudly admit that they are serving Sathmog. Alphilia is fatally wounded and beyond saving. She only manages to utter a gasping warning to the player characters. They are servants of Sackmoth. All of them. Annabella too. After a final after a final prayer to Eladane, she exhales. Hail Eladane, master of immaculate flame. Oh my. Okay, this is interesting. I think I think this happens when Prince Darion is basically like stumbling up the, up the stairs and he basically like flinches a little bit when he starts to see when he starts to hear these heavy steps coming from upstairs and Darion basically get, gets pushed from the side and the, these three thugs are basically like running down the stairs and one of them just like get out of the way and just keeps on running and he, Darren can all can hear as well like we have to get out of here fast when another one of these scum also speaks up and this of course raises the curiosity of Darren and he still quite carefully but now more with more haste continues to go up the stairs and in the end of the top of the stairs in this small section before the temple, Darion can see Alphilia shadow, shadow Leaf on the ground, bleeding and basically like uh, coughing blood. He quickly runs and basically is trying to say like, I will get, I will get you help, don't worry, please, try to survive. She will utter these warning words. They are servants of Sathmog. All of them. A Annabelle, too. This will. This will probably shake Darren a little bit. And he is quite confused. The Annabelle from the tavern? But. She seems so helpful. And then Darren can also hear. Hail Eladane, master of immaculate flame. Alphilia goes limp. It becomes calm, and Darian realizes that there is no more life in his arms anymore. I think a single tear comes to Darian, and he is also a little bit taken back and wipes it off and says, like, <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't even know you, but I am truly sorry and I promise you I try to figure this out hopefully there is some help for me within the temple I need to she needs to be laid to rest so that happened okay let's see if there's any more surprises within the temple area I think the mystics house is within the temple area so Darren tries to make haste he sees the house and can, and he can also see the smoke coming out of the house, so he tries to be quick and just starts to bang on the t door and just ask, Hello? Is anyone there? I, I, I'm in dire need of assistance. So let's see what, what this says about the Drana's hut. Dranat's hut. A simple dwelling with a grass roof and walls of stacked granite. A connecting garden is surrounded by a low fence. Herbal smelling smoke pillows out of an opening in the roof. Dranath. 
In the smoke-filled hut lives the mystic Dranath. He serves some local gods associated with the fire, earth and vegetation. He spends most of his time meditating, but earns a living as a healer. Dranath can treat player characters injured with heal wound at the price of 5 gold coins per power level. Clues if the player characters ask the right questions and succeed with the persuasion role or offer him meat or sweets, Dranath can tell them following. The legend of Um Durman, and we know that already. A thousand years ago, Mr. Vale was ruled by a warlock named Asarel Goth, who, who served the demon prince Sakmoth. Asarel Goth reside, resided in an unholy fortress on the mist shrouded island in the Mirror Lake. His remains are said to be rest in labyrinthine burial chamber beneath the island. Asarel Goth was defeated by a hero, Eladin, with the help of ancient dragon. Eladin then declared his, himself emperor of a dragon-worshipping empire that would rule all, all of the known world. The temple ruin in outskirt originates from that empire. A mysterious woman is sneaking around the temple area at night, seemingly looking for something she lost. Dranath has heard speak in ancient language to another creature which responded with a squeak and flew off. For a fee of three gold coins per shift, Dranath can teach the player characters his skills and spells. Nice! So after banging the door for a little while, Darren can hear footsteps closing in the door from inside the house and then Yes, can I help you? I I'm in need of an assistance. There has been an attack. Are you a healer? Can you help me? Well, calm down, young one. I might be old, but I'm not death. Well, lead me the way. His occupation is a healer, so I would think that he has some kind of pride in his profession. So, Tranat will follow Darion into the temple area where they can find the shadow leaves corpse and do Tranath know shadow leaf i think there is quite high possibility i think shadow leaf was kind of a big figure in town and and she was a warrior and Tranath is a healer so i would think they would have come across so yeah i would say it's it's even very likely that they know each other. 53. The answer is yes, they definitely know each other. Alphilia, my dear. What they have done to you. You know her? Can you help her? I'm sorry. There's nothing I can do. She's well beyond my capabilities to bring back now. Yeah, I, I kind of figured that, but I still wanted to... Try at least. I know, my son, I know. Let the ever burning flame consume her body and return her into the everlasting cycle. Did you did you know who did this? Well, to be fair, I didn't get a quite good look at the the murderers because they were I crossed paths with them in the stairs and they pushed me to the side, so I didn't get a quite look good look. I'm sorry. It is fine. I I might have some ideas who was behind all this, but let's... Can you carry her? Let's go back into my hut. I don't think it's safe to talk here. Yes, certainly. And Darion will take Shadowleaf's body with them and they both will go back into the hut of Dranath. And Dranath opens the door and, and basically shows Darren that he can put her body into the bed. And put, let her rest in my bed over there. But Dranath, are you sure? She is bleeding quite heavily still. Or oh, her body is. That's fine, it's just blood. And if I would not offer my friend a proper resting place, for her final journey. What kind of friend would I be? Just, it's alright, just put her 
There, I let her rest. And Darian will take the body into the bed and still says to Shadowleaf that in a in a whispering voice, I I truly am sorry. I wished I would have been a little bit faster. And Tranat is starting to make some tea. That must have been quite, quite a shock. Please sit down and let's have a talk. And I think they will share the information with each other. They have now in this moment of tragedy, they had a, mu a bonding, a very unpleasant bonding experience, but bonding experience nonetheless, and which truly showed both of them, their characters as individuals and that has created a trust between both of them. So I think Tranath will tell Dra Darion about the, the demon cult and about, about his information that he has seen this mysterious figure talking in a weird, weird language in the middle of the night in the temple and send this screeching screecher on its way. And Darion will also share his information about the final words of the Shadow Leaf, about Annabelle being with the cult as well. Ranath will probably, after all this conversation, say, So, Annabelle is trying to use you to get information out of me and find the rest of the pieces of the statue. Mm. And I think he will stand up and now from one of his shelves he will get the map of the area that Darian still didn't have and gives the map now to Darian. I'm afraid if I don't tell you anything they will just realize that I didn't tell you anything and they will come here regardless and try to beat the information out of you and out of me. So I think the best solution for us would be to play along for now. What do you think Darian? I'm afraid that is the best course of action for now. So you have some idea where at least some of the pieces of the statue might be. Well, I'm not completely certain, but I think... And Tranath will show from the map. Let's see actually from the adventure book, where is this first area? Ridder Mount is that location. Tranath circles the section around the map and says to Darian I believe there is a hidden crypt within the within the reader map location and the book itself states that this location is a final resting place of a powerful knight under the dragon ember service which has now turned into a white which is this undead restless soul and this dragon emperor's most trusted knight was also one of the people who was trusted a piece of the statuette in order to for him to protect it and take this piece of statuette into his grave it's about our walk from here i have now shared you the location but please be careful even though now you now know that the the cultists will probably follow you it still won't be any easier and I think the location is actually haunted so it will be difficult to receive the piece of the statuette. <laughs> Don't worry about me. I will get that statuette and hopefully we can figure something out how we can outsmart these cultists. I will leave right away so I still have the day ahead of me. Very well then. Good luck. And I think there's nothing more to it I think Darren will also ask, uh, do you happen to have any torches with you? Uh, certainly, I have two torches. Do you want to take them with you? <laughs> if that wouldn't be too much of a bother, that would be great. Thank you. And let's add two torches for us as well, so we won't be completely screwed over by the darkness. Here we go. And now Darren will travel to Ridder Mount. And during this one hour travel, Will he come across some kind of random 
I wouldn't say we have now used a lot of random events, but it could be random encounter or a dark omen. So let's ask the oracle table again. And I say it is 50-50 chance that we come across something. That is 48, which is exactly what we need. So let's see what it is. Uh, if I roll a random event, I will choose something else. I will basically I will basically use it as a choose spot because we have had so many random events right now. So I just want to see something else for a change. Two, we get a demonic omen. Ooh, there is D10 demonic omens. One. Dark clouds. The mist over the valley thickens into a dense blanket of dark fog. What little light seeps through turns red and bathes the entire valley in a crimson glow for one shift. Cool. So when Darian leaves the outskirt and is basically prepared to just travel on a fairly light time of a day, he is surprised by this sudden clouds getting darker and darker and finally he can see within like a span of 10, 20 minutes the whole sky has turned into this red glowing sky which is this dark and eerie like this kind of heavy almost like a lead of a terrarium or something like that i think he can see a few flashes from the book of never-ending nightmares of him skimming through the pages and also the key and the piece of the statuette dropping down into the floor. And he's like, ah, I really need to figure out what is going on in here. And I need more light. <laughs> we actually bought torches, but then I remembered that we actually have a light spell as well. You create a bright, li you create a bright light that shines from a focus of your choice. It illuminates a 10 meter radius area around your focus and lasts for one shift of time. The light goes out if, you're, if you reach 0 HP. So I think Darren actually takes one of the torches and just basically uses the light spell on that. And Darren will just say, well at least it won't look any suspicious if I use it like this. So basically these smaller magical tricks within Dragon and Bane you can basically use for free. You don't have to roll a skill check to try to make them happen. You can just pay one willpower point and they will just happen. I, I should actually put it like this so we remember. There we go. So I would say with the help of the map and, and with the added light, Darren will find himself into the Ridder Mound. And now let's have a little bit closer read on what the book says about Ridder Mound. The situation. The old barrow called Ridder Mound is located to the eastern reaches of the Iron Forest. About two days march from outskirts. Well, we have l l closer distances. The player characters can find their way here by rumors in the town. It's a possible location of a piece of the dragon statuette. If, if so, it will be in the sarcophagus room 9 and it will be there. When the player characters arrive to the barrow point 1 on the map, the mound has already been opened by a goblin expedition sent by the orc chieftain of Maladak. These grave robbers have all been killed or rooted, except for poor grub in room 5. Okay, But not before provoking the wrath of the white and some of the lesser undead who inhabit this gloomy realm of shadows. The white is still on the hunt for the grave robbers. It moves back and forth through the mound, slowly but relentlessly, filled with anger over the goblin's audacity. The white is described in detail under the tomb of the dragon knight, room 9, but it can pass, but it can pass through closed portcullises and doors and thereby shows up anywhere. Try to create a suspenseful atmosphere of being hunted like a horror film before the confrontation. Use the white to unsettle the player characters as they sneak around the dark. They can hear its heavy dragging footsteps, rattling of chainmail 
and the loud thud of this of its morning star scraping the walls. Ooh. Okay. For every stretch of time player character spent in a room searching or taking searching it or taking a stretch rest, you can roll on a table below. The room descriptions indicate where random events can take place and which die to roll. You can also simply choose suitable events. Okay, let's keep the random events in mind. Leaving the mount. If the characters leave the mount to rest and heal outside, roll d6 for each shift of time. Okay, okay. I think Darian will first arrive into the outside, right? The spot number one. Let's see what the adventure book says about it. The burial mound, a hill crowned by a tall standing stone, rises in a glade in the middle of the forest. The place is strangely quiet, however, you notice a faint but ominous odor, a putrid stench like, like that of a rotten, rotten vegetables. Stone slab, a roughly hewn, square-shaped slab of a stone, 2-2 to two meters in size, is embedded in the earth at the top of the hill. It has been slightly moved from its original position and a small gap on its side reveals some form of cavi cavity underneath it. The stone slab is heavy, but pushing it side requires no die roll. So Darian arrives into the Ritter Mound and can see all these different mounds, graves around the location. And at first he feels kind of lost because there is so many different graves. He starts to hesitate and be like, a, how can I ever recognize what is the real place? How can I pick out the right spot from all these different graves? But then it hits him when he sees this hill in the middle of this whole burial mound where this hill of a crowned by tall standing stones rises. And and it seems like a location that speaks of authority and appreciation. He feels getting pulled by this location. Tracks and droppings. Clear footprints can be seen in the grass of the hill. A player character who succeeds with the push, push craft roll also identifies small piles of full wolf droppings and goblin ex excrement. The odor is coming from the ladder. <laughs> I see. Well, we can try to make a pushka roll because the odor is and the stench is really heavy. Let's see if Darren can figure out what what left this odor behind. <laughs> what or who? Bushcraft? We are actually quite good at bushcraft, so this might go well for us. And we are still scared, right? Yes, so every check that will require will power will be with Bane. But this is a normal roll. Five, which means we will succeed. So Darren will probably just be... Ah, goblins. I hate those guys. And he can also see this kind of scratch marks within the slabs themselves. Someone has already came here? But why? Why would goblins do this? Well, I better be on my guard. And Darren takes and pushes uh, the slab out of the way and then just carefully keeps on going down. Shaft. An underground shaft opens beneath the stone slab. No bottom can be seen. A musty smell of stale air and dried up corpses rises from the depths. Longfall. It is a five meters to the bottom of the shaft. Each player must make an acrobatics roll to climb down. A rope gives boon to the roll. On a failure, the player characters fall as per the rules on page. 53. Okay. Vaulted cave. If the player characters drop a torch or similar light source into the shaft, they can see that it leads down into the into a vaulted earthen cave with some with some form of doorway in the north wall. I think Darren will definitely drop his torch or <laughs> the torch that is being lit by a light spell and can see all this. And just says that, well, I don't have any rope with me either, so here goes nothing. And just tries his best to carefully 
climb down and not hurt himself. Acrobatics is strong, strong seven. Oof, let's hope this works out for us. 18, it's not gonna work out for us. Could we take another? Yeah, I will try to. I will take the dazed. I think he will still kind of like fall a little bit badly on the ground and like he will like jump down but then the floor is kind of like unstable and slippery so he will fall down from the fall and basically like hit his head into the ground a little bit but let's see if that was enough to slow the fall 14 so no we have to take some damage page 53 on the rule book okay Falling on a hard surface inflicts a number of d6s of bludgeoning damage equal to the half of the height of the wall. Round it down. So 2d6 points of damage. Oof, that's gonna hurt. Oh! <laughs> I take it. 1 and 2, so 3 points of damage. That could have been really bad. And I will say... Our leather armor will take one point away as well, so we only take two points of damage. Because leather armor can also like soften the blow a little bit. And Darren is like, ah, oh god, uh, my head hurts too. And he's been traveling quite a lot. I know it should be take a stretch rest, then we could recover our lost willpower points, our lost hit points, and also recover a one condition, which could be really good for us because we don't know what will await us in here. So yeah, definitely I think Darian will take 10 minutes because the stretch is around 10 minutes in this system and will recover his lost willpower point. We will recover D6 of health, which is three. So we are at full and also we can remove one of the conditions which, which will be the dazed condition. So. Darren got quite big of a hit and he was like, oh, I have to, I have to lay down a little bit. So let's first see what the antechamber says about this location. And then we can roll the random event that will occur in every stretch you spend in this place. Antechamber, a dome shaped chamber with a floor of beaten earth. In the darkness far above the opening the surface looks like a faintly glowing square. In the north wall is a set of double oak doors with the iron fitting. A silvery symbol stretches across the both doors, which are flanked by statues of knights in antiquated armor. Okay. Forced oak door. The goblins have already forced open the oak door, which is slightly ajar when the player characters arrive. So Darian can see this door already kind of like forced open and he thinks for himself like so the goblins really went through here that's so odd what do they want stylized ground with the successful myths and legends role identifies the symbol on the door as a stylized ground from the ancient time when the misty whale was a ruled by a mighty dragon worshipping kingdom I think the stylized crown is the same one that he could see in the temple, so... And he was talking with the Dranath, so I think he can recognize the stylized crown to be the Dragon Emperor without the roll. Tracks in the dirt. Lots of footprints and drag marks can be seen on the dirt floor. Okay. Sleeping bats. A cauldron of vampiric bats hang in the cluster from the chamber ceiling. Detecting them requires a passive awareness roll, okay? Which in turn makes it possible to sneak past them. If this fails, the bats attack. For stats, see page 99 in the rule book. Okay, let's see if Darren can see these sleeping ba bats while he basically like falls down into the ground. And it, because it's a passive awareness roll, we have to do it with a bane. 6 and 2, which is enough for our awareness, barely. So we know that the bats are there. What else? Goblin Poison Dagger. A player character who makes a spot hidden roll finds a curved goblin dagger in the dirt. The blade is coated with the lethal viper venom with potency of 9. Well, he's not looking for anything right now, so we won't find that. And then there is the double door. 
But Darian can see when falling down, he can see like the bats a little bit disturbed by his fall, but they are not attacking right now. But now when he sees the bats, he realizes that he has to be really careful. And especially when he wants to go through the door, because the bats are now located like right above the door that continues deeper into the crypt. And with all that said, and now we know what the situation is, now we have to roll also the random event. Because we took some time <laughs> and just rested a little while. For every random events can take place. The room description indicates where random events take place and which die to roll. Okay, there is no random event die for the first room. I will just decide which which random event feels like the most appropriate one right now. Massacred goblins. I think the massacred goblins is quite fitting in this situation. So when Darian basically is taking a short rest and he has now a little bit more time to look around, even with the torch as well, he suddenly realizes that the smell of the foul goblin feces is even closer and it basically comes behind this stone boulder. Darion prepares himself, unsheaths his sword and carefully goes to inspect the boulder. And I think within the map the boulder is like somewhere around here in the small chamber. You can actually mark it down. So here is the boulder and and first Darion's like whispers to the, to the goblin like get up. I see you. Then nothing, no reaction at all. Then Darren gets a little bit closer and closer and closer. And he realizes that the goblin is completely gone, dead. Darren pulls back a little bit and just thinks for himself. It seems like there is something dangerous to goblins as well in here. I have to be on my guard from now on. And after his break, he realizes that the, he has to go through the doors and the bats are around these two statues over here. And he will, for the moment, stop the light spell and just tries to carefully and carefully sneak past the bats. Sneaking? Oh, we are good at sneaking. That's good. 14, here we go. Yes. 14 is exactly is exactly what we need. So we don't have to worry about that. So Darren will close carefully, takes slow steps and carefully open the door. And he can see the bats look a little bit, shake a little bit and disturb their sleep just ever so slightly, but not enough for them to actually care. And then Darren will go through the door carefully and just just closes the door behind him. And we have arrived to the other side. Where should we go next? Darren has quite many options. I think we have to read the location number seven first. I think that is natural for Darren to wanting to check out this place first. First of all, he will all again cast the light into one of his torches. So we will again lose one of one of the willpower points so he can have a better look this location number seven the guard house a small room with a floor of beaten earth the flickering light of a torch streams through the black iron portcullis in the far wall two mummified guards with rusted chainmail and long spears flank the barred gate Rusted portcullis. The barred door is completely rusted out and impossible to open even with the key from Grub in room 5. It has armor rating of 10 and can be forced open by inflicting 30 points of damage or casting a spell such as Pillar. But such noise will immediately attract the white. Weapons and armor. The mummified guards do not come alive even if the player characters take their weapons and items. The rusty chainmail crumbles immediately if touched. But 
each card has a long spear. Okay. Random events. Roll d12 on the table on the page 37 for each full stretch character spent here. We are hopefully not gonna spend over 10 minutes in here. North Rusty Portcullis blocks passage of the ladies hall. And then we have the two different directions. So Darian goes and finds the, the gate and just sees that it's completely rusted and tries a little bit if he could move the gate and just and just understands that this <laughs> there's no way he's gonna go through here for now. Well, that's not gonna be any use. So which direction should I go then? And then he looks at the corridor to the right and to the left. I'll guess I start from the right and he goes to the right side. What does the corridor say? Mound tunnels. Dark damp tunnels through packed earth and branches off in different directions. The air is chilly and filled with musty smells. Slithering roots, worms and centipedes are hanging from stalactites from the ceiling and make the ground slippery. Random events. Roll d12 on the table on page 34 for each stretch the character spends here. Okay, there's nothing else to it. And I don't think uh, 10 minutes has passed yet. Darren just checked the gate and saw that it's not gonna open and he kept going. So I think it's safe to say that Darren will go into the room number six. The family crypt. The dark chamber with the with a packed dirt floor. Seven simple sarcophagi of stone are lined up along the wall. Several of them are open and two skeletons have been thrown on the ground. Vandalized. Three of the seven sarcophagi have been opened and plundered by the goblins. Treasures. If a player characters examine the opened sarcophagi, they will find four individually buried skeletons. Several of them child-sized, dressed in moldered remnants of beautiful ceremonial garments. They all wear gilded headbands worth of five gold coins each, as well as je jeweled rings worth of three gold pieces. Locked portcullis. An iron portcullis blocks the passage to the ladies' hall. It can be opened with one of the enact keys from Krupp's iron ring, but it requires a successful sleight of hand roll. On a failure, the key breaks. The portcullis armor rating is 10 and can be forced open by inflicting 30 points of damage or casting a spell such as Pillar. But such noise will immediately attract the white. A trap. A trapdoor is hidden under a thin layer of earth in front of the barred portcullis. Spotting it requires searching the floor and making a spot hidden roll. If this does not happen, the first character to approach the portcullis will fall through the trap door. The character falls into, the, into a pit with sharp wooden stakes at the bottom, taking 3d6 piercing damage. A successful evade roll halves the damage. Ooh, Darren will walk through this and can see all these sarcophagi being turned over and basically vandalized. Can also see like that there is like civilians, children, Regular people as well that are being basically robbed blind. That is such a shame. Those damn goblins. Well, there's not much I can do for you now. And Darren basically tries to pay his respects. Keeps on going. And did Darren have any idea or groups being trapped? I want to do a myths and legends roll for him because he is a royalty after all. So he could know if it's like a common occurrence that like these very pristine people would also to make traps for their crypts just because they don't want their they don't want their heirlooms to be stolen. So and I think because he is royalty, I will give an advantage, a boon to this role. Just because this is something that Darren should know. Myths and Legends 14. Let's see how this goes. Six and nine, which means that we definitely, definitely succeed. And now we will also ask the Oracle, is this a common occurrence? And I would say it's very likely that like rich people would also trap their final resting places just because there are so many criminals that will try to 
go and steal all the family heirlooms. I think that would be quite common occurrence, so it wouldn't be unheard of that somebody would trap their crypts. So let's ask the Oracle, and I would say it's very likely that Darren would have an idea, or, uh, or I would say it's very likely that this is a common occurrence. That is 18. So it's not extreme, yes, but yes, it is a common ex occurrence. So Darian would actually have a possibility to, to check the gate from, for traps. And I think when he gets closer and closer, he basically he almost goes close to the gate, but then realizes that there might be traps here. This is an esteemed crypt after all. I should walk more carefully. Let's see if he can spot the trap. That would be spot hidden. That is only seven. So not that good for us. Well, that's a six, so it doesn't matter. Darren succeeds and he can actually locate that there is indeed a trap right under the port column over there. So let's at this here so Darian knows that there's a trap so he tries to like he can see basically that it is this trap door so he tries to like take steps into the sides of the corridor use his hand to see if the door is open but again it is closed and he's like ah oh, damn I think Darian after realizing that he's not gonna get the door open goes all the way back goes into the other room and while he's arriving into this room, I think it starts to be a stretch of time that has passed. So we will roll a random event happening in here after we have resolved what the room contains. So room number five, servant script. A dark and damp chamber, dark out burial niches cover the walls from floor to ceiling. Broken skeletons, moldered rags and shards of crushed pottery can be seen all over the place. Vandalized. The crypt has clearly been visited by grave robbers. Skeletons have been dragged onto the floor, jars have been crossed and clothes slashed. Locked portcullis. A portcullis blocks the passage to the ladies' hall. Broken key is stuck in the lock and the portcullis is impossible to unlock. It has armor rating of 10 but it can be forced by inflicting 30 points of damage or casting a spell such as Pillar. But such noise will immediately attract the barrow fight. Hidden Goblin. Hiding behind the skeletal remains in one of the burial niches closest to the floor is an hyperventilating goblin named Grub. The player character must search the niches specifically or make a spot hidden roll to discover the last surviving member of Maladoc's expedition. Well, first, let's roll the random event when we arrive to this floor. Roll a d12. Okay. Let's see what happens. 11. 7 plus nothing happens. Well, that's great for us for now. Next, I want to make the spot hidden roll for Darian to see if he can, if he can hear the sounds of this hyperventilating goblin. Yes, five should be enough. So we can hear a crop. So one of the stone slabs, Darren is quiet because he is on, on his own this journey. He can hear this very small <laughs> little hyperventilating sound. And he slowly unsheaths his sword. And I think he will calmly say to Grub. I can hear you, come out now, and I promise you won't be harmed. Rob the Goblin is a pitiful s sight, dirty, wild-eyed and panting hysterically. He wears a battered and broken leather armor and reeks of fear and goblin bodily fluids. Okay, that sounds, that sounds nice. Grub's help, poor Grub is scared out of his wits, and his only aim is to get, get out the mound alive. His first impulse is to run, but if the player characters can persuade him to calm down, he is willing to help them. Having observed the white's movements, he can inform 
you can inform them that it moves unhindered through the mound but seems unwilling to pass through the oak door leading out of the antechamber. Okay. Rob has also taken rusty iron ring with three large iron keys, two interact and one broken from the guard house. The rest of the of the broken key is stuck in the door of five and the other two go to the portcullis of seven of six and seven. Only the lock six can be opened with the key. I think Rob will carefully just rise behind from the stone and be like Please don't hurt me. I've had enough. I surrender. I promise I won't hurt you. If you just say what's going on in here. The ghost. It's walking through walls. It can go wherever it wants. It killed everyone. And I think Darian makes a big gulp. Is really intense about the idea that there is a ghost roaming around this place. <laughs> Just please help me out of here. I promise. I promise to help you out. Don't worry. I promise to get you out if you help me open the iron gates. Do you have any idea how to open them? <laughs> we found these keys, but one of them already broke into the gate back there, and. Before that, one of our friends fell into the pit trap. There is a pit trap also on the other side, so I know what you're talking about. Okay, hand me over the keys. We can go into the main hall together and I will try to open the door there, okay? And I won't, I won't do a persuasion check here. I, I'll just say that Krupp will, will be willing to work with Darian and he gives Darian the keys. And he will be like, I'll be right behind you. You go first. And Darren will slowly walk back into the main hall. We have been quite swift, so I don't think we... And we just rolled for the random event and nothing happened. So we will get into the main hall and grab now behind Darren as well. Let's make a quick portrait out of Rob as well. Here we go. That's nice. Little green layer. And then we, here we have Grub as well. Darren will say to Grub also, there are bats on the other side, but I can't go back yet. I have to find the main crypt and find this relic from there. So you decide you can either stick with me or go by yourself and fight the bats. Or you can try to sneak past. But I'm now going to try to open the gate. And we'll what will Grub do? I have a feeling that he now wants to stick with Darian. But let's ask the Oracle. I would say it's likely that he wants to stick with Darian. So let's make an Oracle check to see what happens. 52. So the answer is yes, he will stick with Darian for the time being. And the Grub is like, <laughs> no, no, I, I would rather go with you for now. Okay, just be fast, okay? I will, I promise. And Darren will go here and also try to open the door with the key. And I know that I know the adventure path said that only this door can open. But I want to make an oracle roll. I would say it's unlikely that this door will open, but I want to give it a chance. Will this door open with the key? Oh yes. Is it just enough? 32 is just, it's just enough. We actually opened the door. So, this screeching sound when the door opens and Darren and Grub finally get into the maiden chamber. And let's see first what the chamber says about itself. The ladies hall, the small room with an oak table in the middle and a burning torches on the walls. A mummified woman in gilded chainmail is sitting at the far end of the table. An iron-fitted oak door behind the mummy bears an ancient symbol of glittering silver. The lady is a translucent, faintly blue, shimmering phantom of a tall warrior maiden in full-length chainmail and a gilded headband. Her face looks sad and dignified. 
but when she attacks, it contorts into terrifying death mask with an empty eye socket. The lady is a ghost with stats as per page 87 of the rule book, okay? The lady. The mummified woman is the dragon knight's wife. She guards the entrance to her husband's final resting place and wakes as a ghost if the player characters try to open the oak door to nine or touch the warhammer of fiend crusher. She then demands that they leave the burial mound in peace. She speaks in an ancient tongue that can only be understood with the successful languages role. If the player characters persist in stealing the hammer or opening the door, her face consorts into horrifying grimace before she attacks. If the player characters refrain from doing so, they may instead listen to the lady, lady's rather incom, incom, incomprehensible speech. The words for dragon and empire are mentioned repeatedly as they are as are the name Elodin, something about the struggle between corruption and, clen and cleansing fire. The fiend, fiend Crusher. The mummified woman's claw-like hands rest on a mummified light warhammer set with the jewels. Warhammer is magical and glows red whenever the bearer is within 10 meters of a demon. Wool. The chainmail, the gilded chainmail is light and flexible. Armor rating 4 only gives pains on sneaking rolls. The player character who makes myths and legends roll can see that the symbol on iron fitted oak door is stylized grown just like one in the antechamber. The torches burn with magical fire which automatically goes out if they are removed from the burial mound. Okay. Random event, roll th d6 plus 3 on the table. On the page 34 for each full stretch the character spends here and that's it but Krupp and Darren arrives to the room and they can also see this ghost just coming through the door <sighs> appearing in front of them and Krupp at this point basically just <gasps> just crumbles into the corner and is completely frozen from fear and this this beautiful looking warrior maiden first looks at the goblin and then looks at Darian and starts to be speak this ancient language and let's see if Darian can understand this is something that Darian is definitely learned about because we have determined that the dragon empire is basically the ancestors of Darian's bloodline, so he definitely has heard of our, his family's ancient languages, even though he's not a specialist on, on that front. So languages, it's only seven, but we roll with the, with the boon, so let's see if Darian can understand. Three and eleven, but we take the lower one because it's a boon, so that means we succeed. Darren cannot understand everything that the ghost is trying to convey, but he basically understands phrases and words like disturbance and why and it's like you have no place here and leave. I think Darren will try to convey in this very rough ancient languages that I I am the kin I am the kin of the emperors. I, uh, I am basically like the ancestors and I think he also will show the piece, the piece of the statue just wants to say I don't want to disturb you or anyone else here but please if you have any knowledge or any way where I could find the rest of the statue you can do your nation one more service I think that is what he is trying to convey. And I think the spirit will take a hard look and basically scans Darren from head to toe. And we are definitely going to make a persuasion roll. I'm even thinking should this be with Bane? But Darren has not disturbed anything in the crypt. 
we haven't taken any pressures. We have just been as smooth as possible with this. So I would say it's a straight up roll. And we are not lying. And also he was able, not that perfectly, but he was also able to speak with the language as well. So I think this is just an honest persuasion roll. That's an eight. <laughs> yes. I think the, the ghost will look at Yaron very intensely. And even when she starts to move, she still keeps the eye contact with Darren. And the ghost will basically go again through the wall inside the crypt. And then the door will basically bash open. And she will arrive through the door frame. And she holds another piece of the statue and places it on the table and then starts to like carefully move back and Darren will carefully go next to the table he will carefully pick up the piece that he already has and just tries to see if it can fit and then there is like a, this kind of automatical like a magical magnet and it locks into place with the piece that he has and now he has basically like this two-part statuette that is still missing two pieces. The ghost will say in, in this ancient language again, I have done what you asked, my lord. Now let us rest. My husband is tired. I would hate for him to wake up now. And Darren will take a like deep bow and just say, uh, I'll, I thank you for everything. And just basically shows to Grub like, Let's, now we get out of here. And Grub <laughs> it's quickly just darts out of this room. And with respect, Darion will slowly, slowly walk out of the room as well. And I think that is a great place for us to end the demonstration here. I could keep going, but this, <laughs> this is going to be like the longest video I have ever made already but hopefully now you had some idea on how to pick up different adventure paths if you have like this overarching adventure how you can utilize a ready a ready adventure with like small small details as you can see it base it is exactly like the book says like the mythic gm emulator says that the rules of the mythic will take a little bit like a back seat and just use the book Use the sources that you have and don't be afraid to mix it up. Don't be afraid of just use all the elements that you want. And you can create interesting stories with this. There are many interesting NPCs in these different stories. There are many interesting locations, maps. And for me, it's quite fun. I, <laughs> I really enjoy this form of play as well. It is... Maybe it's a tiny bit more tiring for me that I have to like do so much reading in between. And as you can see from the length of this video as well, it takes a little bit more time. But at some cases, it, it's definitely worth it. Like, it is definitely a distinct way to play solo. Post edit Walter here. When I was now editing the Mythic GME part three, I just realized something very important that I basically neglected the whole time I was demonstrating you how the adventures work. One more aspect that you can always use while you're going through that previous adventure is that in addition to the adventure feature list, you can add those same things into your threat list, into your character list. I wasn't now filling my character list with all the characters from the adventure itself, like we met many different interesting NPCs within the tavern and within the ruins and we even met few antagonists while we were going. So I could easily put all those characters into the character list as well. But mind you, this is something that you can do or you might not or you don't have to do it at all. It always also depends on the adventure, how strictly 
the book itself is telling what the characters are doing at the moment and why I decided to only use the adventure feature list and not the threat list or the character list was because of the how the adventure was structured because like we saw all the random events are intertwined within the adventure itself and like all the character motivations and what they are doing in different moments were written into the adventure so that's why i felt like it was going to be too much if i also add in the aspect of character list and the thread progression list but i think this is the only because of the nature of the adventure which in dragon bane the adventures dragon bane adventures book it was like the whole encompassing adventure but you have like many osr like one shot dungeons and adventures which are their own thing it's not like the adventure book it's not like itself its own adventure they these are like those own individual quests so when you have like these smaller singular quests and missions they are much more easier to wove into your like main open-ended adventure using the threat list and character lists and then you can have the adventure feature lists that also support like your individual quests as well if you have watched this video so this far i th i thank you sincerely i will probably in the future make more mythic gme videos about the extra rules variations that we haven't still covered in here and maybe even something more maybe i could demonstrate how you can make mysteries with mythic gm emulator or something else like that don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to the channel i'm glad you were here it's now moro moro and i hope i see you next time